Um, anybody got a story? I'm, I'm running out of. Yeah, Betty. I got another story. Um, so eventually, I got into the advanced research group. The care was that. Also, Bob, I think you were too. And you were the advanced research group also. So after Jack Trebell left and went to Atari, uh, one of the things he did is he put down some money to, uh, to this company, Amiga, to put an offer to, to buy them for 30 days. He didn't get old. And, and basically, Jack was just kind of waiting for that to expire. So he, you know, after he came on board to uh, try to, to get it for a lower price. In the meantime, they, they flew a lot of us out there uh, to go evaluate this <coughs> two days before this 30 days came up. And, um, and you know, we flew out there as a, a team and looking at all of the three different ships and, and, and we were just crazy about how good they were doing. We were thinking this is the next generation Commodore 64. And uh, I don't know if you guys got anything to, to say about that trip we took out there to, to buy Amiga. I gave a talk on that yesterday. Yeah, you did. Yeah, I, the, the thing I had was that the head of engineering at that time said, go out and figure if there's anything worthwhile getting. And I like, called him back like the first time I could reach a phone. It's like, don't let Jack get this for nothing. <laughs> so, yeah. Anybody have an Amiga story? I remember the, the first time Martin was, I think, the director of engineering. Right. And he said, Carrie, I need you to go out to, to Amiga. And he says, oh, by the way, it takes two, two suitcases. Really? Yes. Go on with pads and pencils because the guys hadn't been paid in I don't know how long because they had run out of money. It was a perpetual problem right. in, in, in that company. And, uh, and oh, hey, here's some money, here's some checks. So I took checks, I took pencils, and I took pads. And they were so grateful when I got there because nobody had been paid in like a month. And it was like on a shoestring. I don't know, how does that compare to when, when you, did you experience it? Yeah, yeah, I, I experienced that. They were, well, the first time I went out, we we were in negotiations with them, uh, you know, doing our due diligence. So they were actually, uh, they saw the light at the end of the tunnel. They were really happy to see us. Yeah. <laughs> it was like the relief team is here, yeah. finally. And, and the, I guess, side of thing, the only thing that really impressed them and made them happy about being by, by Commodore, except for the money, was uh, Jack Attack. They loved that game. <laughs> they play that constantly. Maybe it was his title, I don't know. But. Which I thought Jeff Bruett had, had written, and Jeff corrected me, we, we, we purchased that game from somebody, the Jack Attack for the Plus Four. We got it from two kids in Canada. Yeah. Oh, okay. two kids, that's their name, two kids in Can from Canada, right? Well, they were like 17 at the time, right? Yeah. But yeah, I mean, we added new levels, and you know. But then we ported it, kept porting it to other machines. No, they did not. <laughs> but but we called it Jack Attack. Yeah. Yeah. We actually we actually had a game on the market called Jack. Uh, no, no, that, that was the game. Did we sell it or did we just demoed it? No, we sold it. Okay. It was a popular game. I have a I have a cartridge in the box still said I found it. And then wrapped it. <laughs> wow. But C sixty four I think. I think I posted uh, the original name and uh, the level editor's screens on the uh, in our Facebook group, right? So I wasn't around after the 128, but one of the machines that you guys came up with was the CD. What was it? The CD32. What was that thing called? First, first, CD, first was CDTV32. Well, first was CDTV, which was a Don Gilbert, uh, Gail Longton production. Okay. Uh, Amiga based uh, just with an integrated CD uh, meant to compete against Philips uh, CDI machine. All right. Uh, Carl Sassenrath did uh, the uh, advanced graphics. Uh, I ended up doing user interface uh, various things. But it was basically an Amiga with a CD ROM. Who, who did the hardware? Don. Oh, no. Um, That's what she did. No, no. That was the drive. Uh, remember the uh, Don's engineer? Steve Preckman? No, I don't. I don't. Okay, well, Steve Preckman did the hardware design. Can I tell a 3DO story? Hey, yeah, please. I, I want to tell a 3DO story. He, he worked on the Xbox, by the way, too. I worked in addition to I worked at Commodore. I worked on the CD TV CR. I knew about CDs, and so I ended up going to work for 3DO. And 3DO had this terrible problem where Matsushita was selling the CD ROMs, and they were paying $80 a piece, and they needed to do it for like $35 a piece. I know how to do it, which is why they hired me. 
And <laughs> uh, we, we go and, and, and they're launching and they're still using the old drives and there's a problem and we get all this data and we hop on a plane and we go to Japan and we're sitting in this big conference room with the big projection screen and I'm showing the data about why the boots are taking twice as long and you know, you're killing us here. <laughs> and I take a break and I go to the men's room and in the men's room, there's this wall of CD TVs, <laughs> all this junk that they had built that was left over. So I had a little bit of a difficult time convincing them that I was legit because I had come from that world. And they're like, we lost a lot of money on this. <laughs> they were not happy. But anyway, uh, cool. Cool. Yeah, like I said, after my time. So. Jeff, any questions you can think of? Or? Hold on, there's uh, one in for Al from on YouTube. Uh, what happened to the Brazilian PAL M Vic 2 chip? Was it canceled due to Brazilian market conditions? Yep. Due to heart attacks, I think, of trying to design it. <laughs> well, we did, I did the NTSC version and I did the PAL version, okay? okay? And the CCAM was something that I did not do because it was not easy to put into the chip. And I think you ended up working on that. Diorio. Yeah, Dave Diorio did. Because right. I left right after the whole, right after the Commodore 64 went to production. I wanted to start my own company. But uh, I left these guys a little bit of work to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But um, uh, you, you did the CK, right? Who did that? Do you, Dave Diorio. Right? Right. 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 Yeah, so that, that basically, that had a lot of, from what I understand, that had a lot of hurdles that has to be overcome. Yeah, strangeness. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I don't, I don't know the details of what created Well, that I, I think it was like wax on, wax off for Dave then, because he had forced him to climb so far into the big chip that when we went to do the 128, he, he, he was you then by that time. Yeah, he was there was a lot to learn in that thing. Yeah, I, I, I want to say he learned it. It was about, but, you know, yeah. it was the period from the big one to the big two. That was a three year of video experience plus the other stuff I had. But right. there was a lot to learn to get into that chip for that frame. But realistically, it was only going to be all the counting registers and had to like, change every one of those and make another version. Right. Yeah, right. But it was set up. Why don't we take a Some question questions? From the audience. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to start. Do you want to do a microphone? Yeah, yeah I'm going to start. So, Phil Donahue here, everybody. Okay. Phil Donahue. Who, <laughs> who can, um, have, has a story about the, quote, real reasons that Chuck Peddle died? There's all kinds of rumors. Look, Chuck not died. Oh, my gosh. I'm sorry. <laughs> Chuck Peddle <laughs> left Commodore. Like, you know, there's rumors that the, the VIC-20 pissed him off because he wanted to go in a different direction, as the story I've heard. Is there something else that maybe you can say? Okay, so I was one of the people Chuck asked to leave to go form the Victor Corporation with a lot of the original hardware engineers. Um, yeah, the Vic 20 really did tick him off because they had, like I said, they had a totally separate engineering building, whole team, all their own equipment that were working on the toy computer. And they really thought they were going to get permission to go ahead with that when we went to the a New York meeting with basically uh, investors slash I'm not sure who all was their board of directors type of thing, and so and Jack immediately jumped on. Let's go cheap, which is what he wanted, and he had a reason to go cheap, which was to knock out the Japanese. So the toy totally became a you know, afterthought, and so those engineers weren't happy. They were with. And, and they wanted to go do their own machine, basically, and, you know, so I did go up and have sushi with him and the rest of them, and up in Scotts Valley, California, and, you know, he was, he was upset at how he'd been treated, because he had some options stuff that didn't come through from Jack. Jack was always great at making promises, like he was, he, he offered me his Ferrari if I worked for free for a year. So I really thought about how can I live for a year. <laughs> so I mean he, he but you know he, he would make things and say like you know I'll give you a dime or something like that. I'm sure he had done that with, with Chuck on pet computers and stuff like that where there was some type of you know if this is successful you'll get something out of it and I'm sure he found some way of not, not paying it. <laughs> yeah. He, he, he 
made offers like that to me, and I was like, yeah, I, you know, I'd rather collect whatever you give me right now. <laughs> Did, didn't Chuck Lee go to either Atari or my, where'd he go? And then he came back, and then he left again. Well, he he might have he might have had some in between time because I'm not quite sure where he was when I first started there. He wasn't around, right. and I don't know if he was at MOS. Yeah, he was at MOS. He might, he might have had something in between, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah I, my memory is he talked about doing something for, I want to say Atari or Apple. Oh, it was Apple. He did something, he worked for Apple for a while and then came oh, back. I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Okay, I did not know that. All I, all I know is he was back with the company by the time I did the Bit 20 because that I had to figure out how the heck to make the cassette work. Right. And he had written all the cassette code and did, there was zero documentation in any of that code, so. It was one of those things where he and I had to figure it out kind of at the same time, so. Yeah, that confirms another thing that's been said about the cassette code being, there's no documentation, so. Yeah, that's, that, was, that was Chuck's show. Yeah, he was not good at documenting things. I had heard he sat down with an oscilloscope and a terminal, and any time a programmer sits down, not a programmer, but an engineer sits down programming with us an oscilloscope. That's scary. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, can I talk about cassette for a second? <laughs> so, so and one, you know, we had done two six packs of cassette-based software for the Vic Twenty, and uh, and and Mike Tomchek said, "Okay, Neil, go find us a vendor that can produce them fast because we're getting a lot of orders and we can't make them fast enough." So I sent out copies of Commodore cassettes to a bunch of uh, reproduction houses that did music, and they came back with samples. Then, like nobody could get it working because we were doing square waves, and that's the opposite of what they're trying to do in music. So finally, I've had one vendor that could successfully get us cassettes that actually freaking works. So we gave them the contract, and then they did a batch, and they sent them back, and like most of them didn't work at all. I didn't know if the samples they sent had been created on pets or what. Um, but they kept back, batch after batch that they sent us didn't work, didn't work, didn't work, and I'm tearing my hair out, uh, which is why I look like I do now. Um, and finally. Some sales guy said, look, we've got a bunch of orders for these. We're trying to make our numbers for the quarter. Ship them. And I'm like, I think 80% of these cassettes don't work at all. And they said, well, with the margins that we make, it doesn't matter. We'll still make a profit if, if we get 80% of them back. So we shipped them. I mean, the guy at the reproduction studio had a heart attack during all this. It was terrible. But whoever wrote that cassette code, Chuck Peddle, okay, he's no longer with us, so I can blame him. <laughs> but, I mean, it was not meant for mass reproduction, right? So the company that, that Neil's talking about is Corey Sound, <laughs> and uh, they, we, got, we got the cassette routines actually working well, reliably, when we told them, just fully saturate it, and uh, that magically made the cassettes actually work. All right, well, that was after I tore up and somebody else did it. <laughs> yeah, force, force that square wave. Force that square wave. Give them enough data so that it, it works. The, the routines actually pick up the edge and uh, loaded the data. But that's not something music people usually do on their tapes. <laughs> so at, at the other end of the timeline, does anybody know some interesting facts about why the C65 was considered and then dropped? It, I wasn't there, so I'm not going to answer. It, it was never was. really considered. It was a passion project by one guy. Uh, right. One guy who uh, basically controlled every aspect of the C65. And it was never meant to be real. So one guy, this is a good Commodore, one guy got Commodore to produce and engineer and build a couple hundred of these things, huh? About a hundred, yeah. It, it was busy work also, right? Yeah, yeah, it was never meant to go anywhere except for this one guy. It was his you know, life's work. I, I would have loved to. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's, not, that's not really true. Yeah, yeah, Come on. Yeah, there was a system engineer on it. There was the chip guy. There, there was layout. There was a, a bunch of people that worked on that. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, I know, I know. But it was uh, only Bill. It was his. Yeah, yeah. Not, not me, Bill. Bill. Some other Bill. Not the <laughs> Bill. Yeah. The force of nature Bill was. If you have a question, raise your hand. I'll come.
So there's already so much published about how tough uh, Vermeil was to work for, and yet also was the driving passion for the company. So when he left, and because it was so abrupt, did the rest of the management, that team that didn't escape with him, was there any outreach made to the engineering staff with the, look, we have products to ship and new plans, please don't leave, or any incentivizing? Because, you know, if the, if the entire core leaves, the company, you know, comes to a screeching halt. Was there any outreach like that? I, I'd say the people that left were already thinking about leaving. You, you know, it, it was, I don't want to say us and them, but I, I don't have a good answer for that. Anybody else? Um, I, I work closely with a lot of the guys who left uh, that were engineers, and we were very much, well, we've been forced to use Zilog chips because originally we were going to buy Zilog right. until Exxon snatched them out from under us. But we had a great deal where we got chips super cheap, so we still had to use Zilog chips for future stuff. Well, most of the guys that left, and me included, wanted to do a 68,000 based computer because we felt that was more in nature and we could never get the 6516 kicked off which was the which was what we really wanted to do but nobody would ever go for it um, so it wasn't necessarily that it was like group left but it was not necessarily the group that was doing the Commodore 128 that were working on the on the other computers and in fact like my group which was the Z8000 at that point in time space machines you know it was kind of like yeah it was bad and they definitely wanted some people to come with them but they didn't really necessarily need to outreach because a lot of people had, had enough of Jack I think in some respects by that time and we also had totally different management that we saw day to day Jack did not show up in your office at that point in time anymore and do a Jack attack that was earlier on that, that would happen but wasn't the PC also that IBM released that chiclet PC and that was coming on and people thought that was going to be the best thing ever? The PC Junior? PC yeah. Junior? IBM PC Junior. Um, I, have, I have another question for here from uh, YouTube. Uh, were there any plans to do an IBM AT version of the Amiga side card? I had none. <laughs> So, I mean, yeah, I don't remember, I, we, we got the sidecar. Do you remember no, yeah. Well, yeah, I think that the sidecar itself was really an A1000 thing, and by the time, you know, by the, really by the time I think they had debugged the software that went with the sidecar, the A1000 was kind of in the rearview mirror. Um, they were considering that as, a, you know, that was... That was something, there were a few people within the company at the high level who thought that was going to be important for business, but that's really where the A2000 came from. Is the A2000 was solving the PC problem in a, in a better way than the sidecar did. And so once, the, once we were, you know, in, in 86, 87, we were doing the, 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 A, the A2000, you had, you just needed a bridge card. And there were, you know, they had a couple different bridge cards over the years, but it was, it was, it was a simpler thing to do, and um, a lot of people who wanted to expand Amigas might have been a little interested in, in x86 compatibility, but that wasn't the only thing, and the sidecar kind of, kind of forced you into just having one add-on or maybe a skinny RAM card or something there. So it wasn't, you know, the, the 1000, unless you put it on an expansion box, wasn't really. Yeah, you know, wasn't wasn't quite what they really wanted when they were thinking of the sidecar. Um, it is just yeah, you know, I think a lot of people thought it was kind of clumsy too. It's just and you know again the software you know there was a lot of work done on the software a while even while the bridge card was a, was a thing. It was it, it was a pro you know it was it was a work in progress for quite a while I think. Okay, we have a question over there. Yeah, so Bob, your name is all through the kernel source code for the CBM two machines. Uh, can you talk about that project? Because the, the hardware was all over the map. Uh, there seemed to be no consistency. Nobody knew what they were. Nobody seemed to know, even in the company, if they were going to sell them or they sold some, then recalled them. Some were prototypes. So could you just talk about that project? You're, you're talking about what I call the P&P &P series? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. I mean, that was, that was the code that I was working on when 
I tried to get the Commodore 64 to evolve basically out of it. So yeah, my yeah my fingerprints are all over that stuff. And I had a I had a team of guys that were working for me by that time. I was able to find a few good hires out here that were doing software stuff. So, but I had done most of what was the kernel because I like that concept of split. You know, having a separate operating environment, even though I couldn't do a real operating system. So, um, the big thing was is those were the Porsche design cases to be business machines. They're all about the hard drives. They were going to be sexy, you know, look like futuristic terminals and stuff like that. And we had the 6510 chip to do memory management, so we could go beyond the original memory. That so was I got on this. I um, I did the uh, fake swap right for. Uh, be able to run kernel code from another bank as well. And I also did the uh, CPM port to that machine. There was an 8088 card uh, for that where uh, I did the BIOS mostly on the 6502, uh, so it was nice and lightweight on the uh, 8088 side. But uh, there was a hardware problem with that port, and I don't know if it ever went anywhere. But <laughs> it was, uh, the board was interfering with, it was too close to the, uh, to the 6502. 6510, yeah. yeah. Oh, nine, yeah, right. 6509? Yeah, that's the one. So, yeah, there's two boards stacked too close to together. They would uh, interfere. Because I was spent a week out at uh, Digital Research trying to do a multitasking, multi threaded version of it called CPM83. And I finally hit a wall that uh, it wouldn't work. But I didn't get CPM ported to it. I don't know what they, what they ever did to it. And I'm not sure if they ever published uh, the uh, bank swapping code in it also. But, you know, you could write kernel code in a different bank. And it would swap automatically, automatically down to the lower bank and run the kernel code and then return back up. A lot of pushes and pops and things like that. But, uh, this is what? DT expert? Was that the code Yeah, I think that was it, yeah. Any more questions from the audience? Uh, I might be messing up names, but I think the person who, at least who's memorialized on this might be on the panel, so it might be a good time to find out if anyone remembers the story. On the deathbed vigil there, it's, I think it looks like an Amiga floppy drive that is shoved into a wall and someone put a frame around and named it. And I, I, if you put a frame around something and name on it, it must be a good story behind why it ended up in the wall. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Dave Haney and I worked on the A3000. We spent a long time working on that product, and there was a day when uh, we were just going to get the production unit out. Uh, but the boards came back, and we just had to validate that the boards were okay, uh, that we hadn't messed up anything. And I was super careful on that program. I double checked every netlist, I, I tracked every change, I was just all over it. And so there couldn't possibly be anything wrong with it, but you still got to check. And so I build the unit up, and I turn it on, and things are kind of working, but the floppy doesn't work. I'm like, what the heck's going on? And so I spend a lot of time, you know, swapping out power supplies, swapping out Agnes, swapping out Paula. I mean, how can this even happen? The, the motherboard doesn't do any value add to the floppy functionality at all. And just, I spend all day on the thing, and I'm pulling my hair out, and I'm comparing a working system with a non-working system, and I'm drinking coffee, and I'm reading books, and it's like <laughs> 2 o'clock in the morning, and it's still not working, and i got to ship this, otherwise I'm dead. And then finally, the really small light bulb goes off, you know, the one that, just by virtue of the fact that it has emitted a single photon, it, it, is, it, it goes off and says, you know, try swapping the drive. And I swap the drive. And lo and behold, it's been this stupid, cheap drive holding me up for 12 hours. For, or five years of my lifespan, by the way. <laughs> and and I, I lost it, man. I, I took that thing and I just winged it across the room. I, I was trying to propel it into the next universe, but the wall stopped it. And, 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 you know, I went home. And then, and then, you know, the next day, smart-ass Bryce Nesbitt comes in and he puts that frame around it. <laughs> and, and there it's at. And then, and then he goes and does this video with it on there, right? And then I go to a job interview, and that job interview I go to, they're like, uh, do you have anger management problems? <laughs> That's the 
the story. <laughs> Thank you for clearing that up. <laughs> All right, we have another question over there. All right. Um, can you tell us what happened to the EX64 versus the SX64? I, I saw at some point in time both existing and yet the double drive never appeared. Yeah, I'm going to piggyback on that. I, I heard the DX was just a, a rumor. It never existed. So. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think we actually did the DX. Uh, maybe it was just something on a piece of paper written down, you know, sold. But we never, we did the SX, and uh, it wasn't immensely popular because people just aren't that strong. You can tell the SX owners, though, because they have permanently imprinted in their hands these lines. Because our, our case designer, really like lines at the time, hard plastic lines. They went everywhere. And having opened up a, an SX, I can't imagine putting another drive in there unless they came up with some little mini duplex drive or something, because there's no room at all. There was a low profile drive that was smaller profile than that. It was made out of sheet metal and they tried it earlier at Commodore, but it basically couldn't hold any tolerances, and they thought they were going to get something like that back again. <laughs> Too cheap even for Commodore, then. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? Anybody? What can you tell us about the partnership with HP that seemed to actually come to fruition for some IC fabrication, and there seemed to be some grand plans for software or graphics stuff? Um, So when, when Commodore was building the, the Pandora chipset, the, the, what everyone calls AGA outside of Commodore, um, we, we, we had the, the new Lisa chip was done in CMOS. And Commodore had its own CMOS process, but it was 1.5 micron, and it was brand new, and it wasn't, it wasn't quite enough. Um, so we were, we were making Lisa's using HP as a, as a contract fab, which really wasn't a thing people did all that much back in those days. It's not like today where like, you know, almost every chip company uses contract fabs. Um, and that was, you know, that was, but you know, it's, HP was this gigantic company. Um, there had been some discussions with HP kind of at the end, um, trying to interest them in using our graphics chips, uh, particularly various graphics chips that didn't actually exist yet. Um, <laughs> Uh, they were, uh, they had some interest, but not enough interest to buy the company. Um, I think the, I think the main thing they were trying to interest HP in was, uh, was a, a chip design that hadn't really been built yet called Ombre. Um, that had a, uh, that was a, a, a new, a, a totally re, reinvented chipset. It wasn't, it was actually just two chips. It wasn't. Amiga compatible. It was kind of in the spirit of Amiga a little bit, but it was uh, it was um, uh, it had its own uh, PA risk processor on it. Dr. Ed Hetler, who was one of our chip designers, had designed his own PA risk processor, and then added 3D instructions on top of the regular PA risk instructions. He chose PA risk mostly because it was an easily extensible risk instruction set. He didn't he didn't get any IP from HP on this. He just built it on his own. And um, I don't know how far along it was because the chip, it, this was this was in 93, 94 when Commodore wasn't really building much of anything because we had no money left. In fact, we had a big empty negative black hole in the bank account, I guess. But but uh, but that was that was as I understood it. They were they were very actively trying to find somebody to buy the company. Pretty much all of 94, and it, and there were some discussions. I wasn't even involved in the discussions with HP. Um, I think some of the people who stayed on after June in um, in '94, when all when everyone retreated back to the MOS building, had 
at least been in on some of the meetings with other potential buyers. I was I was gone by then. I had left in June, so I, I wasn't really a, I was in on some of the things that were being discussed within the company, but not in, not in actually any of those meetings. And I'm not sure how real how seriously HP was interested because I didn't hear it directly from them. I just heard that we were talking about it, and that's. You know, that's something that they were discussing was we were we had something that might have made a very good workstation graphics card at that time, even though it wasn't done, it was you know, it was one in progress, it might have been an incentive for them to invest. I mean, we've had other companies interested in in licensing or, or OEMing. Uh, at one point Sun Microsystems was interested in using Amiga three thousands with Unix as a low end platform. Um, Epson was interested in OEMing some of our stuff, but somehow they always managed to uh, to make those deals not happen. Another question over here. This is going to be in the weeds a bit, but uh, since the fellow, I think his name is uh, Dave, was also talking about uh, FAB and the process that uh, Commodore had, it reminded me that the IEEE article on the 64 talked about the heat issues inside of the, the VIC-2, which everyone already has known about. And in fact, the person who was interviewed, or a person from Commodore, was saying, well, we have a new plastic that dissipates heat as well as a ceramic package, which I thought was, well, this is, Captain, we cannot change the laws of physics. But, but as the Amiga comes to Commodore, and the, the masks were delivered, and you have to implement their design now on, Com on Commodore's process for manufacturing. And I've seen this over a couple of 1,000s I've looked at. It alternates between which of two of the three, I haven't seen one of all, with all three of the original chips done in ceramic packaging, as though the process was still being relearned or grown out because the complexity of the chips was greater than the VIC-2 had been relative to, say, even the original VIC. So was there that sort of thing going on? In other words, did Commodore have to grow up their manufacturing in order to accept the complexity of the Amiga's chips? Well, the one thing we were doing, we only had, as Dave said, one and a half micron processor. When I started in 81, it was three, three microns. We went down to one and a half. But even after that, they were also doing um, optical shrinks. So you actually take the masks, you make them, and you shrink that mask, basically trying to make it a bit smaller, and also making your gates smaller. But there was no, I mean, one and a half, I think, is as low as we got. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, the only thing I can think of, and Albert and I were just looking at each other, is there was a beryllium lead frame they came out with for the R6 or R7 VIC chip to extract the heat out through the leads. And so in, in a circuit, most of your heat leads through the PC board in the first place. It's not really the part you see at the top normally. Um, so that may be what, what you're thinking of with the plastic. It's really about the conduction of the heat through the lead frames was, was my thought. Yeah. The lead frame, the design of the lead frame would help that heat. But the original deck, because of the fact that we had to have the, the high voltage supplies in it, Megahertz, which was pushing the limit, that's really where the, a lot of the thermal was. And in my time, when you saw a ceramic package, sometimes that meant we bonded it ourselves at MOS. Um, so that was like the typically in the R&D cycles and the quick turn cycles. And then you'd wait the six weeks for Kyocera, I think we were using to do the dip encapsulation for, for the plastic pack. So they would be more like production. So it took that a longer lead time, is my memory. Yeah, I mean, and, and, and you know, as it was alluded to, it was also the case that uh, when you know, versus the VIC-2 chip, the uh, Amiga chips would be done in a, in a more modern uh, uh, H uh, HMOS 2 process, I guess, same as the C128 stuff. So it was, you know, it was, it was smaller geometry, so heat was heat wasn't not an issue, but it was less of an issue per transistor slide. Any more questions? When you went from the Amiga 2000 to 3000, what made you choose that form factor? Because 
The Amiga 2000 was like a large computer, had a lot of space inside. The Amiga 3000 seemed more like a Unix workstation and really didn't have as much. What was the thought process behind that? I didn't like the 2000. <laughs> Nobody liked the 2000. <laughs> and, and, and so we tried floating things around until we saw something that we liked and we ran with it. But, but why didn't you like it? That's a serious question. Are you serious? Like, the serious work? answer is, are you kidding me? <laughs> it, it, it's ugly, right? You, you know, it's huge, it's big, it, it's just, it, it's a PC case. And how sucky is that, that we've got our own computer company and we're building PC wow. lookalikes? Wow. You know, that, this is wrong on every level. Wow. And so, I, the 3000, that, that thing, I'm proud of what we did. Yeah. Uh, and, and a bunch of us worked hard on it, and we made the machine that we wanted it to be. Okay, and, and, and I didn't mean to pick on it. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's a valid question. We just didn't know. And, uh, you know. Well, and then they went back with the four thousand to, you know, hey, we can buy these cases, and why would you do that? I, it just that, yeah, that, it made no sense. We, we, I mean, we were, we were engineering all of our flat cases to look like Commodore computers, why not do that with them all? I mean, it was, yeah, the, I mean, the 3000, I mean, the 2000, yeah, it was nice big and you could put a video toaster in it. Oh, of course, video toasters didn't exist when we built it. The, the only reason we really did, we, the only reason the 2000 went out that way is the, the case was designed in Germany and, um, you know, they, they were the guys also doing the PC stuff for the most part and we, we, when, when we brought, when the project came to the U.S., it was in 85, 86, and um, I guess it was 86, and, you know, Commodore, uh, we had had, we not, had not had a really good year. We didn't have a lot of extra people working on stuff. It was me with help from George Robbins doing the whole A2000 motherboard, and Terry Fisher, of course, doing layout, and um, we weren't, cha we were doing a cost reduction. We weren't changing anything. None of us in Westchester liked the 2000. It was ugly. The, key, the stupid uh, mouse and keyboard connector ran right past where the DRAM had to go. So it was, let's, let's take the thing we're going to attach an antenna on and run it right past the noisiest possible part of the entire computer. I mean, there's just so many things about it that were ill-conceived. I understand what they were trying to do, but they didn't even try to make it look nice. Like, could, it couldn't have done something. So when 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 it was when the ball was back in the court where where we could do what we wanted to do, we did what we wanted to do, and yeah, you know, and there there had been a call for something more compact that sat on your desk too. That was another thing. It's like not everybody was putting these things on the floor, and we also did ultimately have an A three thousand T that you could that looked like a PC and you could put on the floor. Uh, two regrets about that case. One, I screwed up and did not make sure a toaster fit in it. So th that's one. And the other one was the zip ram. I don't know if you remember that one. I'm sorry. 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 i am we weren't quite re wasn't quite ready. What we really needed was to wait several years until you could get EDO DRAM on a DIM or a SIM. But we we had to choose between the stupid zips that were using our static column RAM, DIM, static column motor RAM, buying off the shelf SIMs or coming up with our own SIMs, and that's the way we went. The, the zip. The, we, we messed up. <laughs> it was the wrong decision. It, it, there were other things we could have done that were better, and they were solved on the A4000, I guess. This, well, because they had to screw up all the other stuff on the A4000. So. <laughs> the good news is it was the kind of place where you can make decisions, sometimes, I mean, not always, but it, you know, making decisions and screwing up trying to go hand in hand sometimes. Uh, Dick 20 Memory Map. Any funny stories why the video RAM moves when you Expand a K or more. What is that? The, 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 the VIC twenty memory map where you can expand. You say it louder. If you if you expand the VIC twenty more than eight K, the the video 
RAM moves in the memory map? Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we didn't have that big expansion card at that point in time. <laughs> in fact, that was I was had a fight to even get a memory expansion for that computer because that was thought to be totally unnecessary by the management. And, um, what five k is too much? Five k is enough for anybody. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, there were there was there were some flaws in there because I had only a part-time hardware engineer to work with me on the actual computer design. He was a good guy, but he was busy with the toy computer. So, yeah, there was there were some flaws in that when it came to hardware. But hey, it was shipped. <laughs> Any more questions? Got one over here. Um, how come the CD32 was only sold in Europe, and did Commodore recognize the lack of success of early CD-based systems like the Philips CDI or Sega CD? back in 1990-ish, 
to do something different, what would you have done differently? and say, look, we have software. Yeah, I, I think that a lot of Commodore was a function of Jack Vermeil and his legacy that he left. He created an environment where we had, there was the Santa Clara group, there was Japan, there was Texas, and there was Valley Forge. And they were, we were competing against each other. Part of it was that Jack felt that he had all these divisions competing with each other for resources, and some would rise to the top of the best idea. Well, it was a reasonable solution, but still it created a lot of tension in the company. And on top of that, Jack was the one guy, all marketing flowed through him. He gave engineers a chance, as you can see from the commentary here, we all had a lot of freedom to do things. Marketing did not. It all ran through Jack. So there was that, he was the pivotal guy that said, okay, that's why he had a, com I always just a comment about him saying, make it for the masses, not the classes. Well, you can see that in the product line that was developed early on. And when he left, there was no structural management business plans. Did anybody ever hear of a business plan at Commodore? No. No. When, you know, when, when, I, when I started companies, we did business plans because there was a reason for that. But that didn't exist because Jack had it all up here. So when he left, there was a, a total void that existed, and they tried to fill that back, fill that in. Right. And they brought in lots of different about the Amiga, we, I was I was given the opportunity to go to New York for the launch, and uh, we were at Lincoln Center, Andy Warhol came in with Deborah Harry, we did the painting, we did a ton of commercials for the Super Bowl while I was there, that had so much momentum, and no marketing behind it, so that was actually a great machine, there, I, if you look at it today, what it can do, it's, it's amazing, what <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> wait a second, we, Bill, we, we didn't like prepare this. How is this happening? <laughs> Every time there's a, there's a comment, he has a t shirt to answer. <laughs> His wardrobe is, is gone now. Home. This is it. Where are you moving to from here? <laughs> we gotta see what the next t shirt is. We gotta see the next topic. Your question was a lack of marketing, really, and lack of follow through on momentum. And the 64 and the VIC were the right product at the right time, and they kind of sold themselves. You go to Costco and all the discounters, and everybody wanted it. It was, a, it was a rising thing. With the Amiga, it became more of a sell. You had to prove to people, why is this useful? You could do that again. No. That was the problem with that transition. Yeah, after Jack left, there was a transition from selling in Kmart, and they tried to market the Amiga in, in, in dealerships. Uh, and so there was a big layoff of engineering at that time, and I said, put my name on the list while you still have money, because the marketing team just didn't have it together for, for what they want to do with the Amiga. That's my, my, my opinion, yep. and you can fight me on it if you want, but... I, yeah, well, you, they bought a company without having a plan. Mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's really, I mean, that's what I say, that, that, that plan didn't exist again, because Jack wasn't there, and, but yet, I thought it was a good acquisition looking from the outside in, and it's fun. In my opinion, it should have really been the next home computer. That's what it was designed for. It was designed to be the next home computer and not a business machine. Yes, and because that's what they established as a niche that they owned. And uh, that's that's it was, yeah. I mean the thing the thing was it, it did become in reality. 
reality the next home computer when uh, A500 came out two years after the, uh, well, not even quite two years after the uh, after the A1000, and that was, I mean, the A1000 got, you know, other than that initial push, there wasn't much marketing of any kind, and yeah, but I've heard I've heard from a lot of people from Europe uh, also that yeah they were they were selling always selling always trying to sell the business aspects which just weren't there. Right. Um, that I think that wasn't the niche that yeah, Commodore owned. It was never the niche the Commodore owned, and it wasn't the niche the, that the Amiga did either very well. I think there was another thing that marketing never quite coped with at Commodore. Even even I mean they did pretty well in Europe, but that was mostly about games. And part of it was that when you know, the heyday of the PET, VIC-20, C64 when it started out, um, you bought a computer because you wanted to do computers. You didn't know what you were going to do with the computer. Pretty soon you found out you wanted to play games, but you bought it because it was a, you know, it was, it was a, a $500 computer, it wasn't that expensive, everyone, everyone told you. I mean, you know, Jack won, you know, Commodore won a Clio for the, 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 the kid who went off to college and, and got sent back because he because he was an idiot because he hadn't had a home yeah. computer. Guilt, you know? guilt advertising. Yeah, yeah. They so I mean people just wanted a computer. After a while, it wasn't I want a computer, it's I want to do this thing with the computer. And that was a fundamental change that you know that I mean a lot of companies didn't react to, but Commodore certainly didn't, because there was a lot of stuff you could do with Amigas. And there was never an advertisement, well, there was rarely an advertisement that told you other than the gaming, which actually, you know, that's why they sold two million or close to two million A500s in Europe in the year is because, you know, the game was the thing and, you know, you could go to the UK and get the Batman pack. <laughs> but again, that's yeah. made it stayed in that category of, of it, whole right. game. And, and there was nothing wrong with selling that, it, you know, and, and, you know, but we also had that video niche that, where was the advertising for that? Well, maybe you got an ad at the, in the back of Toaster magazine or something at some point, but you know, Commodore didn't pursue that. They didn't push it. And, you know, and we did have a CEO who didn't use computers and didn't watch television at that point. So you know, maybe the fact that you know, and, and also knew everything. I think that was part of the problem too with management is when you know when management doesn't know things and is. You know, a brilliant manager, they go and learn those things. And when, when they already know everything and no one can tell them everything, you know, a lot of things go wrong. Also, the fact that you know, Commodore has plagued for years by the fact that we had super high executive salaries. They were making, you know, some of these guys were making more than the CEO of IBM or the CEO of Apple. <laughs> so, uh, So uh, I wanted to. Well, you've seen my film, you know how I feel. <laughs> so I wanted to throw something out from the uh, from Usenet, if you guys remember that. Uh, famously, the quote was, "Commodore marketing. If they were selling sushi, they would call it cold raw dead fish." <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the original impetus for the uh, purchase of Amiga actually came from a. Betty might remember this. A general management meeting in Europe. Uh, they, they met where, you know, what should they do next? This was after Jack left. And they said, they sent back word, we have to compete with the Sinclair QL. <laughs> and, and that's actually one, why we went out looking for a third party, almost done machine to, uh, to release as the next generation because we needed to compete with that QL. The quantum leap. Almost <laughs> before so I remember in the 90s, I was at the World of Commodore, and they had, they had that whole big thing at the Palladium. That was when Harry Copperman had taken over Commodore, and he was releasing a lot of new things. But he did have a marketing campaign, and I remember he hired a company called Mesnevetier Burger Kerry Schmitter, and I worked with a guy named Jeff Berg on there, and we were going through the, all the different uh, demos and stuff to show on there. Does anybody remember the Stevie commercials? Yeah. Yeah. Those that was the that was the advertising campaign. And, and I actually have a video tape of that. But that was about the extent of any real advertising. And then as soon as Harry Copperman came, as was as soon as he left. Like he came on, things were happening, then he was gone and it seemed like everything stopped. Does anybody remember those times? Yep. Okay, what was video tape? Yeah. <laughs> 
I don't have anything to add. Yeah, yeah. Um, they, I mean, really, um, Irving Gould was playing musical CEOs for a while there, and um, there, it was it was probably a three-year problem. If, if if a if a competent manager had been brought in as CEO for and and allowed to change Commodore for a solid three years without being interfered with, something could have been done with the right person. Actually, it was funny because. Uh, uh, Jean-Louis Gasset of Apple had tried to make that deal with Commodore to come and run the company, but he wanted, you know, he, he wanted three years. And that, with an engineering background, maybe that was a guy who could have made, who could have uh, ended up with a different result. Of course, he went on to make B, and that didn't really go anywhere either. But, but at least they gave it a try. No more questions. The audience. All right. I, um, let's see. We're trying to wrap this up. A few questions from. YouTube, um, someone was commenting on the Commodore 64 Basic and how it compares to, so like for example, Simon's Basic. So Simon's Basic was an extended basic. Um, it didn't, per, you know, the, ba the basic that came with the Commodore 64 didn't provide easy commands for graphics and sound. So do you have any comments on, you know, the appearance of extended basics to fill you know, fill that need for the extended graphics and sound. I'm going to piggyback on that one too. I'm not even uh, graphics and sound. Where's the else statement? <laughs> if then else. Yeah. Okay. So six weeks, you could do a certain amount of work, <laughs> and then you have maybe a couple months to actually get the bugs out of it, and then you can release a chip and realize that you have left out one of the lowercase characters. So <laughs> yeah, end up having a penny deducted from. Paycheck for as long as you're at Commodore. Um, no, we knew other people were going to do more with it. That's the whole reason that the cartridge, that Simon Basic, was a fantastic example of people taking advantage. You know, if we'd had a faster disk, I think we'd seen a lot more things that loaded into all that RAM that was sitting there hidden underneath the, the Basic and the operating system. That was all meant to be swapped out and something better to be put in. And that was really the whole genesis for. You know, why we had the heavy duty programmer's reference guide, why, you know, there wasn't, you know, not only did we tell you how to program in basic, but we tried to tell you every trick that we knew at that time. All right, I have a question for Dave Haney. There were some AAA prototypes shown in the deathbed video. Any background information, what happened to them? Were they scrapped? They were not scrapped. Um, that was a that that was a motherboard I made called Nix that was just to prove those chips. Um, chips didn't work very well, but they did. We did get graphics up on the screen. They all needed revision. Well, maybe they already needed revisions. The problem was the Andrea, the Andrea chip had a bug where the uh, output buffers on the data bus wouldn't try state. So the only thing you could see on the bus was the Andrea chip. You couldn't test any of the other three chips. Um, that that was that board was not a production of any sort board. It was just an experiment to to give these chips a home when once they finally arrived. It had connectors for my logic analyzer all over the place. It had um, it had some things I was experimenting with, like it had uh, it had um, ROM on a uh, on a SIM module. It had um, actually had chip RAM on on modules as well. It had a network in it. It was it was just it was just for testing out a bunch of new ideas all at once, including AAA. There were three of those made. One of them was killed based on a, a combination of tragic uh, errors. One was that uh, I put a I put a, um, a, a 12 volt uh, pin on the ROM module to allow us to use Flash sometime in the future because that was just that was a very new thing. We couldn't afford to put it on there, but you could. You know, when you, if, instead of putting a ROM on there, you could eventually put flash memory on there. Um, the problem was that uh, the it sat, that pin was right right next to a data line, D D5, in fact. And the other problem was when uh, when my buddy Fisher made this SIM module. We Commodore made, never made SIM modules. The the measurement was a little bit wrong, so the thing wobbled. And one day I was out of the lab, and some chip guys came in to do some experiments, and they plugged the module in. The wrong way, and D5 on that board got shocked. So that board was no, that board was toast. 
There were two other boards. I, I ended up taking that one home and selling it at a charity auction. I was raising money for breast cancer. And uh, the others uh, were went to two of the chip designers. Those are the ones that, that sort of kind of maybe worked. Um, there wasn't much we could do to fix the chip bugs. Uh, those chips actually had had even more bugs that were, were fixed a little bit. There's a thing you can do called fibbing, focused ion beam. You can basically, you can basically laser your chip to uh, change a few things. So we had, we had one chip that was fibbed to uh, fix it so that it would work with regular DRAM and one chip that was fixed to use with VRAM. Uh, there are a few other things. There was a, there was a program that allowed you to skiggle a graphic image to display because the LUT was all messed up. The order of the, of the colors were all messed up. So it, nothing you actually put directly into the graphics buffer would look normal or anything you, even recognizable. But if you skiggled it around a bit, it, it would it would work. That was uh, some of the software. Some of the chip guys were writing all these routines in AREX to control it. So it was it, it did stuff, but it wasn't it wasn't. Really, uh, you know, wasn't wasn't even close to a working system, and those three boards were there. And at you know, in '93, they weren't going to be making any new chips. That was we got what we got, and we tried to get as far as we could with it, and you know, sort of had our fingers crossed that at some point, uh, you know, somebody would come along and like Superman and rescue us, and maybe we'd be able to make some more uh, some Rev twos, but that never happened. All right, uh, we 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 could probably keep going on for quite a while, but I think it's time to start to wrap it up. I just wanted to make one comment. Um, you know, it's anniversary of the Commodore 64, and you know, Jack Tremell was saying, you know, computers for the masses, not the classes. And you know, when I was a kid, my first computer was a, um, a, a that I used was in middle school. You know, Apple IIe doing logo. It was like, well, I want one of those things, but it was like. $1,200, I couldn't afford that. So my brother's friend was like, I have a Commodore 64, the whole set. You know, for $150, I'm like, oh wow. My dad's like, yeah, I'll help you. So I was actually able to get a computer that started my interest in computers, was to actually to be able to afford the computer. Um, and so that's my story for the Commodore 64. Pass it up back to Chris. I, I speak for everyone when I say we are very appreciative of the last two and a half hours that you have just given us.
And I said, what do you mean? It's the Autobahn. It belongs to the German people. And he said, during World War II, I built this road. He was a slave in the, after he was in the concentration camp, and he helped actually construct that road. And that was the message he wanted to share. <laughs> Um, I have like a little personal fun one where I had the Z8000 team and we flew over for a show in Germany and we took the corporate jet. The jet was supposed to take, but you know, it kind of a small jet. So he took he took regular, but everybody thought that who was going to show up was Jack Tremell. So at the airport, there's the mayor, the marching band, <laughs> everything else. <laughs> Luckily, we got diverted, so we landed at another airport, and they were like trying to figure out how they could make it to Hanover Airport to greet Jack. It was just a bunch of engineers. <laughs> so, and meanwhile, while they were unloading the plane that particular time, they forgot to the, the, set the gas, so it flowed between the two wings. So we're carrying stuff out of the out of the private plane and it's stepping more and more <laughs> <all inside. laughs> and we're like I think something's wrong here because the wing's about ready to hit the pavement and they were like oh yeah we screwed up <laughs> so, <laughs> so it almost got real exciting so I guess I'll continue the thing and tell a Jack Tramiel story um, Neil actually told part of the story uh, I was uh, at one of the Hanover affairs I happened to rent a uh, a 280 SE as my rental car. And that was the largest car of anybody who was renting. So I ended up uh, chauffeuring Jack uh, Tremel and Sig Hartman around for the entire show between Hanover and Braunschweig, which is where Commodore had its uh, engineering office at the time. And so, yeah, we drove on the Autobahn, and Jack actually pointed out to Sig that this was a road he built. Um, and like his, they were also drinking pretty heavily on the way back from the show. Uh, and at one point, they just started singing German songs. <laughs> so, yeah, I, Jack loved to sing. I, I told that story to Leonard Tremell, and he said, oh, my dad loved to sing. <laughs> it was definitely a surreal experience. Uh, a side of Jack I'd never seen before. No, I really can't talk to anything like that. <laughs> My time at Amiga, DRAM has been a problem since uh, before Christ, I think. <laughs> we, once we got money at Amiga, we would go shopping in Silicon Valley. And we'd go up and down, was it the 4 or something? In, uh, I don't know, in, in Silicon Valley. And we would go buy DRAMs, there'd be tractor trailers full of parts. And when we needed parts, whether it be resistors, bypass capacitors, or RAMs, we'd have a lot of money. And I would go with the text because I could, you know, figure out will this work, will that work in the circuit, and we we build products that way. So it's nothing new. It's been a chip shortage forever. Yeah. <laughs> well, I wasn't at Commodore long enough to have a Jack story because I started in October of '83, and Jack left uh, right after, not long after CES in '84. Uh, so, um, but. Uh, it was it was a good ride, <laughs> with it, even without Jack. I'll tell a story. So uh, the A five hundred is called the B fifty two. Anybody know why? Because George Robbins, who did the A five hundred, lived at work, had a big ass stereo system in the CAD room, with giant speakers and turntables, and you would go in there at 10 o'clock at night and start playing B-52's music, which is just old. And you wouldn't leave until 6 a.m. in the morning with the jitters, because you've just been in there all night long. But, uh, anyway, a little tribute to the CD changer, all full of B-52. All full B-52's. Yeah, there was, a, there was kind of a corporate raid on Crazy Eddie when they went out of business. You guys might know that from being up here in Jersey. And so the speakers, the the stereo, the uh, the the multi, the back when you had a cartridge for your CD changer, all came from Crazy Eddie, and they were all over Commodore. But George had it all built up in one cubicle, 
And yeah, you, 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 if you were working late at night in the, in the cab room, you'd hear B-52s, at least five albums worth. <laughs> Some, sometimes he'd reload. <laughs> so, uh, let's see, uh, early in 94, I uh, was called in on a Monday morning. Uh, about three or four of us were called into a meeting. It was just a weird group of people. And uh, we were told, uh, yeah, you guys were out on Friday, and uh, you know, things aren't going so great. Feel free to use the fax machine, the telephones, print your resume, whatever. And, uh, you know, if you need to look for a job, and all three of four or five of us, whatever, I don't feel so bad about where I was Friday. And interestingly enough, I was on an interview with Dave DiOrio, who I followed to BLSI Technology. After there, I got uh, laid off. The day I got laid off, the woman in the other room had said, uh, Dave Dior is on line one. Uh, literally, I just shook hands, got my severance check, and Dave offered me another job. So I followed him to the next two companies. Actually, you uh, you probably know that the, uh, the uh, uh, Rock Lobster uh, uh, printed on the board of the, uh, of the Amiga 500. You probably did that. You didn't do that one? Okay. I, I, I did a different story. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, I'm going to tell one on Andy because he was, uh, uh, he, he was, he drove Jack, you know. But Andy, I would go back and forth uh, between the 1200 Wilson Drive uh, location and the MOS technology because I was taking care of the PDPs and the Maxes. And, uh, Andy would blow by me every day as he was on 202 going to the, the 1200 Wilson Drive. And it was, it was, I, I, I can't believe he never got tickets. He just, it was, it, it, it was uh, uh, sonic booms when he would go by me. Uh, and it was every day. I, I, I don't know, how long did it take you to actually make that, that, that trip? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he had this little rocket ship. It was just something. A little Toyota rocket ship. Anyway. I wasn't at the company a whole lot. Uh, I spent some time there in the beginning, but then I did most work off site. But one thing I do remember is uh, when I came in, it was often different decorations. Uh, you walk in and go and go to the lab and there was a big hole on the side of the wall. <laughs> Somebody had poked a hole in the wall to get to the other side to, to get in because they couldn't otherwise. And, and I'm used to trick of going over walls myself at, at certain companies where you know people go home at night that have normal jobs and, and engineers typically work until the job's done and you have to go over walls. And I actually at another company went over a wall once and after I flipped the lay on the guy, I, never, I didn't even know, what do they call those things? The, the pins that stick up, they stick papers on? I almost got screwed by one of those. <laughs> I landed it, and I landed on the paperwork, and I tore the paper a little bit, and it was like, what do they call that? Spindle? Yeah, it's like, like, yeah. There's a name for that, I don't know. People, people think that'll injure you. Yeah, <laughs> but the, the people that used to be away, they kept the paperwork from getting lost. They stuck it on, on the needle one. That's a that long. Anyway, uh, but it was always entertaining to come down the Commodore. And the other thing that I found very entertaining was hardware that wouldn't work, ICs that wouldn't be working. I'd go into the lab and you'd see these wires. And, and I had the ice cube tray, but Bill had all these wires. And, and it, sometimes it was an external voltage and power supply, and he put power on, a, on an IC that. Not on the IC, but actually on the pads, uh, the the substrate. And so he was playing all kinds of games, and, and I'm a hardware engineer also, and I know a lot of these tricks, but Bill often amazed me. So, you know, um, a lot of my stuff was, I was young then. <laughs> and uh, it was a very interesting and fun place to work. And uh, the group of guys down there was top notch, and everybody worked and did everything they could to get the job done. And time was never, time was always a factor, but as far as the people working there, it wasn't, oh, it's five o'clock, it's time to go home. That, that was never really the attitude there. Everybody worked, get the job done.
All right, Bill, last words. Um, I don't have any stories to add. I told most of my stories. I'll plug my book, uh, Back Into the Store. Uh, so all my book stories are in there. Uh, but the book was dedicated uh, to Dave Diorio. Uh, that it was him that he affected my life a lot. He taught me how to see past the chip boundary into what the chip's doing. And uh, I, I was, yeah, the Dave Diorio. So, All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Bill, for inviting me. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, it's amazing. Right.